where you are. That's good. That is good. Let's let the uh, restream uh, pour in here. Hi from Ireland. Hi from uh, West Virginia, wow. where there's no cases or few cases. Uh, so, Bob, how are you holding up with all this? How's the how's the treatment program? How's uh, what what well, are addicts up to? There's so much to talk about. I'm okay. sorry to speak over you. All right, So, ironically, I thought we were going to have to close and no one would come. Drug addicts are running to the rehab because they feel like it's safe in there. Hmm. Interesting. It's strange, right? Yeah. See, I told you, these new millennial drug addicts, it's not the same. If it was me, I'd be out looting and partying. <laughs> but, but, but the millennials, they want to be home safe with mommy and daddy in the rehab. They aren't the uh, addicts of old. They are not. They don't have the same personality. They don't have the same kind of, you know, I know antisocial personality isn't the greatest thing to have. I've carried the burden of it for decades. But it is valuable in certain instances. It serves a function. <laughs> yeah. Functionability. So, so anyways, yeah, uh, we're at Allo, you know, we've seen an increase in admits. Very peculiar. Mm. I, I thought we wouldn't. Uh, the main question was, because as they go, to, I called you the other night. What does the word essential mean? Right. Like, so far, government is not giving guidelines or definitions of things. So they said only essential services. So right away, I'm thinking, well, outpatient isn't that essential. No, there is there yeah. is a whole, there's a document. And can you just turn Bob up a little bit, Susan? Okay. Uh, there's a document that uh, has everything all broken down. But, but medical, so they don't break down the medical services very well. And so I would argue that any medical services are essential. Yeah, they're followed by a psychiatrist, so I figure it's essential too now. Yeah. If pot clinics are essential, uh, outpatient for drug and alcohol treatment is essential. People asking where you're working now. I have Aloe Treatment Center in West L.A. and Malibu and Silver Lake. And I saw the picture. A-L-O. I saw the picture of Shelly going to work with an N95 mask on. Yeah, she's paranoid. Well, <laughs> she is a little. I mean. She is a little frail. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, I agree. So there's so much rumor going on. Like at first when I heard about coronavirus, I thought, well, I have a, I, I don't have a compromised immune system anymore because I got rid of the hep C with the thanks to Gillian. Gid, uh, Gilead. Gillian? Gilead. The Gilead. Same, same people that made and, one of the treatments for the uh, coronavirus. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, this new new technology of medicine is amazing yeah. so i don't have hep c but i do have you know whatever liver damage is done and i've been sober for 24 years last monday so i'm thinking how susceptible am i i'm in good health my heart's good i did the old man checkup like two years ago everything was good ran on the treadmill so i'm thinking like well i'm 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 gonna be all right and then but but then you hear that 22-year-olds have it and 40-year-old doctors. And so there's just such misinformation about it. All right. So let's just talk about who's at risk. And everybody gets it. Everybody can get it. Children don't seem to get it very well. It probably has something to do with the, the proteins on the surface of the lung that the virus needs to get into the lung. It, it attacks the lung. So children can get it. They just don't seem to get it very well. When they get it, they don't get complications unless they have some underlying compromise. Same thing is true of young adults. Uh, in Italy, the fatality rate on young adults was like 0.1 percent, and in uh, for for uh, for older folk, it was eight and a half percent. So it's right. a, it's a lot different if you're older. The lungs are different when you're older. The virus affects you differently, and just your age and you add your liver disease. I'd say you're in a risk category, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, really, the hard part is going to be what's next. I mean, this is this is I, I hate to say it, but the, the call to clamp things down is sort of an easy move to make. The harder part is how do we get people back to work? When? How do we understand the graph on the on the outbreak then? And who goes back to work? They may hold you back. They may ask you to, you know, limit your activities. Well, I am six years under the deadline, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you consider the deadline? What do you consider the deadline? They said, well, the, the original deadline was 65 and older. Now they're, who they were quarantining. They're bringing it down to 60 now and again. So. Okay, I'm one year under. All I'm right. one year under. All right, all right. <laughs> no, but, but you know, it is it is a scary time and a weird time. And I have a friend who has emphysema really bad who's yeah. 62. And That's he's bad. like, 
if I get it, I'm dead, right? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's bad. That's bad. Well, it also depends how much um, the uh, Plaquenil works, the hydroxychloroquine. I, mean, I, know, I know the infectious disease doctors are using it rather routinely now. I know it hasn't been approved yet. The FDA is working on it. We don't have the kind of data we'd like to see to really know what we're doing, but I know it's being used a lot. So by the and end does of- that need to be used early on before you're ventilated? Yes. Does that you need to be? Yeah. Yes. So you need early diagnosis, which yeah. is our main problem here in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, I agree. And I hang on one second. Uh, did you? Yeah, my son is noticing that. Uh, Prince Albert of Monaco was testing positive. <laughs> First world leader to test positive. I went to co- I, I went to college with uh, Al- Albie Albert, and uh, so I know his situation a bit. Uh, I'm sure he'll be fine. He's a very healthy guy, and he'll be. Why fine. do so many basketball players get it from the sweat from exchanging yeah, sweat? Yeah, because they're really in intimate contact. Now that's that's some of the data that's coming in today. Is there is increasing evidence? Um, Oh, now they're saying I'm low and you're and Bob is too high. So, uh, Susan, if you could adjust that again, please. Uh, that um, that you, it appears that you don't you. It's not likely. Not to saying that people should cut back on their care. No, they're being careful about surfaces. But it seems like person to person is the primary means of transmission. There's some data that came in. I think it was from China on healthcare workers, and it showed. If they have, if they were not in direct contact, they didn't get it, and so that evidence has been flying around for about a week or so. And there's a good study about that today. So you really need to be in proximity. That's why the three to six foot radius, you know, six feet ideally, away from somebody could be really effective, very effective. What's interesting to me, so with this shortage of masks that they're expecting in the next week or two, especially in New York City. Why don't they put the mask on the infected people? Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Why, if you're out in the world, they've actually asked you to do that. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure why I'm they don't. I'm saying in a healthcare setting, in the hospital, why doesn't why don't the 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 people with the virus have the mask on, and then that keeps the the uh, I, I think it's because workers safer. I think it's I, maybe they. Do they again? They do recommend that for people out in the world. They don't recommend that for people that are taking care of somebody in the home. In the home, they say you, the the caretaker, should wear the masks. Probably because when you cough, it it sprays out. That's my bad. It'll blast right through. Yeah, the side. and you don't want somebody with shortness of breath with a mask over their face. Well, I'm guessing some crazy times. <clears throat> it is, and and you know, I remember during 9/11, um, addicts kind of got it together a little bit. It's like they that's when they kind of they kind of they kind of straighten up a bit. Yeah, no, I well, what I've been saying, I've been on, you know, dopey and a bunch of podcasts. People asking, you know, I told you some guy killed himself in San Jose and they were trying to say it was because he was caught. We'll we'll say that again. Say that. Tell them that story. That was a good. Well, a lot of, you know, because of my association with you, I guess when they can't get a hold of you, newspapers and. (laughs) people call it get a hold of me yeah. and there was a apparently a suicide in san jose last week of somebody who had just been quarantined and then there was kind of this this questioning of does quarantine for addicts and alcoholics and people with mental health issues lead to suicide or something i was like no suicide suicidal people you know suicidality leads to suicide right you people have with, to that's a with, specific with, medical symptom yeah, and and uh, but there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on. But the addicts themselves seem to be always do well under this kind of the rest. We just had the Woolsey fires. I told you a year and a couple months ago. Yep. And not one. I had 54 clients. We had to relocate them within two hours, all to different Airbnb houses in, in the outpatient at Silver Lake. It was chaos. And not one ran away and used, not one, not one person. They were all just like, we got to do this. We got to get out of Malibu. We got to get to Silver Lake, like a, like an army of junkies. Yeah. Then after all was said and done, everything was settled. And we got a new place. Like about two weeks later, like six of the people that had survived the fires and all the chaos and not knowing and, you know, just the, by the seat of our pants that day 
went and used because <laughs> they were bored. Oh, boy. That's not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so addicts always do well in these kind of circumstances, I think. And, you know, you know the genetics of that. It just makes you more attuned and more aware. But what I've been saying to people in all these different things that I've talked about, people need to stop and do some soul searching right now about what is my purpose? What is my relation to the other? What is What, if, what do I believe in? Yeah, I because agree. I think America hasn't done those, that kind of thinking for a long fucking time. I, I agree. What What are you thinking? What are you, could, could tell me more? Well, I just remember after nine eleven, that's what I did. I I lived in downtown L.A. and I was kind of scared, so because I thought it was going to start happening everywhere. So I bought a house out in Joshua Tree in the middle of the desert, thinking like if the, if the SHI hits the fan, I could just go to Joshua Tree. <laughs> That's how my Joshua Tree Odyssey started, kind of hysterical. trying to get out of downtown L.A. That's hysterical. And so I did a lot of soul searching about what is life? Is it about money? Is it about fame? What is it about? I, I had a lot of time out in the desert just post 9-11 in, that, in those couple months before the new year. And I really thought, like, life is really just about friends and family and connection and people and community. It's all it really is about. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and I, I've get... been saying, look, I've been saying, too, it's also things come into focus and priorities get nailed out, you know, sort of in focus very quickly. Um, I've noticed that healthcare providers are ready to step up. I mean, I'm in a risk category almost. But um, if they need more physicians and I'm, I'm on record, I'm going in. I don't care. It's it's right. time, it's time for us all to step to it, show what you're made of. Now's the time. And so if they to need decide, to... yeah, you know, and you're and you're starting to see what pe some people are made of. They're on spring break in Florida. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Well, that but, stopped. But that goodness. Inter... That craziness stopped. But yeah. but you have to start putting everything together with what you hear. Like what I had been hearing, you know, because I got sober '96. I worked in a restaurant. I was struggling to get back on my feet and whatever. And Anthony and Flea, my two best friends still lived in LA, right in the same neighborhoods like Beachwood Canyon and Los Feliz where we'd always lived. And I remember I asked Anthony one time, like, you could live anywhere in the in the world. Right. Anywhere. Right. And why do you live here? And he goes, because you live here and Pete lives here and all our friends live here and I grew up here and this is my town. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's why because we're connected to each other. That's why. And and I would argue that we might be better off. You know, there was a lot of acrimony in this town with the way the politicians were managing things. And suddenly with this, they swept all that aside and have been taking swift action and, and very proper, very good. Yeah, although although I, heard, I heard because the homeless are not streaming into the facilities that they have created for them, they've told them, well, at least separate your tents by six feet. Well, you, you know, I was talking to somebody, you know, all these comparisons of America and Portugal and America. And I was talking to somebody in Holland, and they were saying that their homeless shelters, they, they're, they're amoral. So if people want to shoot heroin in their homeless shelter, they, they do it. Well, that's our— Here in that's, America— No, 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 that's our thing, too. We do that, too. Trust me. That's the problem. That's not. That's not with the missions. You can't. You can't do drugs or drink in the missions in downtown no, LA. No, no, you that's can't. That's why the people stay outside them for the food relief. That's right. They don't go inside. No, that's correct. There, so, are, there are certain ones you can't. You're right. You're right. There are certain ones though. There, right. the the government sort of. I my my point though is if you let them use and you don't administer to them, they're gonna die. That's well. That Holland does. Holland yeah. has. You know, safe injection sites. They have a very progressive kind of uh, healthcare attitude about addiction, rather than yeah. a criminal justice thing. Right. But, but, you know, so that makes. And I think about all those people in downtown LA that are in those tents. If they could have a safe, warm place to be, but, and then we're kind of monitored and counseled and stuff about their drug use, rather than say. You can't come into the mission and sleep No, no, here. Bob, Bob, if, you're, you're, you're well behind the curve. All the stuff that the state of California is setting up is that way. I'm telling you. They, they let them use. Well, and the problem well, is it, 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 it's, it's a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe because they don't administer to them. And, he, and, they, and there is a lack, a denial about the depths of the mental illness. And so part of it is they don't want to come in because they don't want to stop using. And they also can't tolerate being in a room because of their psychiatric state. 
and then they also want you know will keep using in, in in dangerous ways. So it's 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 a mess. It's a mess. Well, how does Holland deal with the mental illness component of it? They must they, have they, some they other treat system. it. They they require them to come off the street and get treated. They have they have the ability to render the care. We refuse to render the care. Every every other country in the world renders the care. They just go, excuse me, your, your brain isn't working right. Let, let's get you stabilized. Then we'll, you know, and they, you can even some places have directives to physicians. Let's say you get a diagnosis of schizophrenia, then you and I will work together while you're compensated to set up a directive. So when you decompensate, you tell me what to do that in, in writing, so we can go ahead and get you treated and back back on. The way the laws are now, if you say you know you're Napoleon and you're hoarding your stool. And you like what you're doing, even though your leg is rotting off, you can't touch him. Right. That's the it's way they the extreme insanity. But for the most part, I think that people are lost and, and have mental health issues and addiction issues. And there's no, we're not really dealing with it in a holistic way, you know, right. in a complete way. We That's deal right. with one part of it, another part of it, another part of it. But I've been saying for 20 years, because I was without a home mm -hmm. uh, of my own free will, because I like shooting drugs in cars and being on, you know, on my own, being consumed by my addiction. That there, if to call it a homeless problem suggests that we don't have enough homes. Right. I'm pretty sure there's. Then all we would have had to have done 20 years ago is build like 50,000 homes, then we wouldn't have 50,000 homeless people. Well, but now with this crisis, they brought down trailers and opened up hotels. They're still on the streets. So they've, they've opened up thousands and thousands of, of facilities. It's not working. It's not working. So we, we have it. We have it now. And we have the money, too. The money, government's put, put that money aside a long time ago. But uh, you can't, you're not allowed to get, pe you, here's the deal. When I had talked to you when you were in your disease, right? Right. That's not Bob Forrest. That, that's a brain, it's not working right. And that's why you thought oh. it was a good idea to do all the things you were doing. Yeah, it was, uh, I just always say you, you get you go from whatever you call it, experimental use to habitual use to just a drug taking machine. That's all you are. Right. Get money, take drugs. Right, right. Get and that's money. not that's not your brain in a in a state where it should be making decisions about where you live, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you know, I, I you know, I'm more for freedom than you sound like you are. I think that there's ways to cope people and co and coax them into tr into getting well but you can't do it with religion right which is what's been practiced for 150 years you can't do it with criminal justice because they don't even they don't even have the wherewithal to really engage addicts or mentally ill i mean i was in la county jail there were schizophrenic people just banging their heads against walls and yep. shit yep. nobody was doing anything Yep. There was there was nothing going on. Yeah. So we have to deal with it in this bigger, more broad, more kind of uh, complex and comprehensive yes, way. Yes, agree. And it doesn't seem like like you can get everyone to agree on on a what it is, right? Right. And b how to attack it and what that's going to cost, and then ultimately, yeah, what that's going to cost. Well, no, no, they've got billions of dollars with a B. The problem is the laws are not uh, allowing That's people not to... true. That's not true. I don't know where you're living. I just tried to get somebody into a detox unit last Thursday. Right. There's one month long waiting list. Oh, that's a different issue. That's a different issue. The, the, well, the availability of services... Need if they're, yeah, that's what people need. Detox. They really do want it. Availability Even of services is a mess. I totally agree with you on that. And by the way, if, if Governor Newsom declares California a disaster because of the corona thing, we can immediately begin building residential facilities because that sweeps aside the regulatory problems that prevent them from being built. Yeah, the detox is essential. I mean, there's yeah. just not enough detox beds. And then people are – because here's what's happening on the street. I got some – it was even last week when I was trying to help this guy. So – as as they close the border, the the cartels are telling their mid level dealers, you know, raise your prices because dope heroin is going to get scarce. Yep. Right. Yep. So I heard, that's one of the reasons why that guy was motivated to call me to see if I could get him into a county detox. 
because that scared him when he heard that. So then I started thinking, what's going to happen is there's not going to be a scarcity scarcity of fentanyl. Right. And you're going to have thousands of addicts across the United States start using fentanyl on a regular basis because they don't want to be sick from not being able to have find heroin. Yep. Yeah, that's true. It's another kind of side byproduct of what I think is going to happen. Hey, Susan, did I see Shelly on the thread here? Does she want to call in? Yes, you did. We did can only you? take one call at a time. Oh. She had to call after Bob. Oh. Hi, Shelly. We were, we were talking I don't about have the big the call-in studio. I just have it on the phone. phone too. I get it. I mean, I could try to add her phone number and see if I could do it. But yeah, we, you might, could. we might lose Bob and have that to would not be good. Back. Let, let has um, an ad call on here. Should I try? If you want. Let, I don't let, know if she wants to talk. I mean, we'll see. I'll but text so, text so, Jude, let's get back to that thing, though. Yeah. What people on the streets are wanting is detox desperately. They're scared. Mm-hmm. Like, I get I get, I get instant messages and calls and text messages the last week for sure that people want detox. And there just isn't. That's why they're coming into Aloe. If they have parents who have good insurance, they kind of know they have access to that mid-level care or whatever but the county people the people with medicaid yeah they're desperate to get detox right right well and but but you got to remember a lot of people are those programs like medicaid medical are advocating outpatient detox right suboxone that's what they're advocating you know it's kind of starting to change the last six months it's not working that's not working no kidding the, the suboxone outpatient right you know, because the addicts know it's not working. Ah, Sydney fear. What are you having? Ice cream? My daughter. Oh. <laughs> hey, daughter hey, Bob. Here having ice cream. People want to talk a little bit about Corona here. Let me let me get back into that a bit. There was a good question about asymptomatic carriers. There's more information today. About oh, a- I got a good one from Dr. Paul Farmer at Harvard University. Okay, you tell about me about him, but I'm going to tell you what I read uh, some studies today that shows that. Apparently, asymptomatic carriers are are probably less of a problem than people are thinking. Yes, because and this is what Dr. Farmer said: they don't sneeze and they don't cough. Right, right, <laughs> and How makes great people is cough. That? And when I first but saw and that, I was like, this is the end. We're doomed if there half the people are asymptomatic. Right. They're going to spread it everywhere. And the the data suggests that the people that were being counted as asymptomatic and picked up in South false Korea, positive too. No, they were false positive, but also they were pre-symptomatic. That is apparently a significant majority of those got sick two days later. So that's oh, that's interesting. But and it was a small number. It was a very small number. But remember, you have to have direct contact, much like Dr. Farmer said, with uh, somebody who's coughing. So it's interesting. Interesting. Oh uh, well, yeah. What, how do you feel about answering some of the questions on Facebook? So let me see if I can get Shelly on. Uh, so meaning Bob has to go on hold? No, I'll, well, yeah, for a second. And then I'll okay. see, because I think I can add a call. Let's try it, because we've never done it before. It'll be fun. Okay. So have Bob Shelly maybe coming in here. Okay, let me tell you one thing that, that is an actual, absolute, quantifiable fact. Yeah. There's a lot of people... Especially, you know, the more irresponsible part of our society saying, oh, when it gets warmer, it's all going to clear up. That is not true. There's new cases in Rwanda in very, very dry and warm climate. It's not going to die with summer. It we'll stays see. We'll see. active on the surface a lot, a lot, a lot less in, for less time. In the heat. But there is. I, I can tell you there's new cases that were in the last few days in Rwanda. Let me just look at my text message. I heard it could come I, back in the summer. Well, I can tell you I've got the list of countries here if I can get it to come up. I'm lo- uh, the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource page is the best best page I know of that really – Harvard. Harvard. Yeah. There are new cases in Haiti and Rwanda, which are 80 sub- subtropical places, very warm. Okay, Bob. I'm and try and, to get and as he made the point of saying, Drew, listen, the the flu pandemic in 1918 hit an African continent in, in August. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm still looking for Rwanda, and I don't. I'm not here. It is no. Can uh, I tap in, Shelley? Go ahead. I mean, there's probably oh, the beginnings of cases. Okay, I'll look at the restream <laughs> here. 
Uh, somebody is saying that the flu shot makes people more disposed to um, coronavirus. I need to see that data because that doesn't make any sense at all. Hi, Shelly. Okay, now I'm like, let me Hi. work. Let me How are you doing? Oh, good. Oh, I saw you with your... In is she in? Oh, she, he's on hold, so I can only swap. You can take him off hold. I know. I, it, it won't let me swap on because he's on face, face, uh, FaceTime time audio. Shelly, you there? So let me let me go back to Bob. I'm here. Let me go back to Bob. Hold on. Okay, go back to Bob. Yeah, it didn't work. I think I have to FaceTime her too. So okay. it's all you, Bob. All right. Well. Well, let anyway. me just quickly let me just quickly talk to Shelly. So just for a second, I'll, then I'll say goodbye okay. to her. Let me go. Right. She's okay. on the line after all. Okay. Uh, hey, Shelly. Yeah. What are you seeing out there? Well, you know, it's been really complicated, you know, it's, yeah. it's been an interesting situation. I, um, you know, with, with everything they're asking us to do and, you know, the distancing and, and all that stuff. I mean, I basically had to, you know, I, I tried all of the different ways of like making people safe. And then it just came down to the fact that we couldn't operate under the guidelines. You couldn't operate. So did you close, did you close down? Unfortunate. So yeah, we just had down. to close down Friday. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, good. Yeah, I uh, just, any exposure? Are you okay? You see anybody sick? Uh, no, I didn't. Well, I can't say that. I, I, I was taking people's temperatures, and sometimes they were they were a little elevated, so I would send them out. Good. Um, so there was that before we ended up saying, you know, we, we just can't safely operate anymore. So we had to shut down. But there were people with temperatures. I'm not sick. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm fine. And, uh, some people did get sick and stayed home and then returned to work. So, I mean, it's hard to say without having the testing, you know, it's hard to say what happened. This, this is one of the risk benefit problems of the shutdown is that now you're going to have a whole population of people that could, some people could die because they're not getting care. Right. Well, what I did is I transferred everyone who didn't complete 30 days of treatment. I transferred them to different uh, programs, and I completed, and I gave everybody full resources. I got them um, refills on the medications. I gave them every option that I could come up with, all the referrals, and um, I did get people into other treatment centers. But that, pro that provided they stay open, right? Provided they stay open, I know. But right. my the treatment center I was running, you know, were over fifty people, and I just couldn't safely do it. Right, I get it. I totally get and, it. And you know, I was I was afraid for my staff. I sent them home, and we did everything video conference. But then when it came down to getting everybody out um, and everybody six feet away from each other and all of that, I just didn't have the resources, and I couldn't turn it around that quickly. Right, right. Well, stay home, stay yeah. well. Let's get through this. Going to, I think it. I think it's not. I don't. I. I think within a, a fairly short period of time, you're going to be able to start rendering services again. I suspect, but we got to see. A I'm going to do change. some online services. Good. Yeah, I'm going to do some online services. Um, I'm going to set up. I've been doing VC for quite some time, so I'm. I'm pretty. I'm pretty good uh, with that already, but. I'm going to start seeing people, you know, just, just over video conference and do the best I can. Good. That's good. All right, Shelly. Thanks for stopping by. It's good All to right. hear your voice. Hang Shelley, in there. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Okay, bye -bye. Thanks. Love you guys. Bye. Stay well. You Bye. Too. Bob. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. All right. So you heard, could you hear what we were talking about? No, no. What was she talking about? Just that she had to shut down because she couldn't, given the guidelines, she couldn't maintain what she needed to do to keep everybody safe. So. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Good. And she had resources where she could send everybody to, but if that's if those places stay open, so who knows? Yeah, it's it's rough with the housing. In what sense? Well, you're supposed to not ha you're trying to not have roommates. You have people right. with temperatures. We can't get tests for the people to know whether they're infected or not. Right. So we have to quarantine them. <laughs> you, you have to have the luxury of a lot of bedrooms. Right, and because it's because it's flu season, a lot of people got temperatures. A lot of people are sick, but not from this. Yeah, let's keep in mind that e when you even right now at the current testing rate, with all the restrictions on testing, the the percent of positive is still just ten percent. Do you know that? On the tests that have been have been um, 
here. Administer? Yep. Only 10% positive. That's with the high so level. So people of have the regular flu and they think they have this. Yes. And you can't tell until you test. Right. So that's rough. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy thing because, and then upon admission, I just adopted what UCLA and White Memorial and SC, County SC did for employees. So my ex-wife is a nurse at White Memorial. And if they have a temperature, they're not to come into work. But if it clears and they're temperature free for 24 hours, they can return to work. They don't have to wait for 14 days. Mm -hmm. Somebody was asking for the the research out of China that showed that the healthcare workers didn't get so much of the illness. I can't find it in real time here as we're looking around, uh, but there was a study out that was published that was distributed widely in the press as well. So, so it, you know, again, it, we're trying to figure out how to manage the risk. Any thoughts? You heard any stories about the uh, hydroxy hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, I've heard that the, the doctor friend of mine back east had used. They used it on three ventilated patients. Um, what was it? One died, two lived. Is that is that the one you were talking about? Oh, there's been a bunch of them. There's been a bunch of studies, but they're none but of them are great. Been a lot now. They're now they've got a lot of that medicine, right? Initially, a week ago, they didn't have that. Yep, they're they're distributing it widely, and and I and I'm wondering if that's one of the reasons they're waiting to get the word out on it to make sure that there's enough here before they sort of start saying it, it's working. And and uh, you know what I do like. I'll, I'll, here's the silver lining. I do like that everybody realizes how ridiculously bureaucratic and re and nonsensical our government agencies are. Right. It didn't seem like anybody from Nancy Pelosi to Trump himself disagreed with this is ridiculous. Get rid of this crap. You mean the the stuff that was in the way of them doing what they needed yeah, to do. Yeah, I know. Doing the right thing. That's really you know they're, I mean? I, I've been saying for a while that we will evolve because of this whole thing. Our government will function differently. We will think differently about things. There's a lot of evolution going on here right right fast. Yeah, just, uh, uh, you know, just, and it took Trump, and, and as crazy as it sounds, to say, hey, if you're dying, wouldn't you want to just take whatever medicine they think might work? Like, that's just commonsensical. But they're using it earlier. They're using it quite regularly earlier. Oh, I know, but I, I mean about anything. The FDA and... and, uh, and yeah, you know. I understand that. But some people do believe that. But doctors tend to be, you know, our, our first priority is do no harm. And I was listening to an Italian doctor talk, and he said, so you know... we kill you with the drug. And right. Or it might, or might make this particular illness work, or the outcome's worse, or the outcomes might be worse. I heard an Italian doctor saying, look, we do supportive care really well. If we start throwing in experimental treatments, we might undo what we do well. And I, I thought the point was well taken, but I think we have to study this actively. It's why, it's why Dr. Fauci is so cautious. He's a scientist. His job, the clinicians are out there trying to do the best they can and make a risk-benefit analysis every time somebody comes in. They are starting to use the drug. Fauci is a scientist, so he can't say anything till he has the data. Then he can make a declaration based on the data. He's not. But Trump, but Trump tweeted it out like two days ago. Right. Well, he saying he feels like it's something that's going to work because he's hearing about it. And so, look, he's not a scientist. He can do whatever he wants. And uh, we'll see. We'll see if we start using it successfully. I know it's certainly being used. Yeah. And you know, I noticed the death rate didn't 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 increase the way I thought it was today. Right. So let's talk like about that. Let's talk about the numbers. 234 to 270. Right. I expected to go to like 400 the way that the infection rate was going up. Well, the infection rate is at 24,000. And the last two days, most of that has been the backlog of testing coming in. There was right. literally just a ton of medic of testing out there that yeah, came through. Somebody told, me, somebody told me that it might be simultaneous, the number. I know this. You know, I like I have a dark sense of humor. So because of the backlog of tests that is adding to the positive, yeah. right? Yeah. That person might already be dead. So they click the positive and the dead. Well, I know you're not supposed to laugh over well, like but, that. But, but that's how incompetent the whole thing is. No, no, it's not incompetent. It's working and the and it's it took a little while to get it, you know, up to where we want the data. But the point is 
most of the increase you're seeing is just the backlog of tests, not you the rate of the increase testing, changing. You don't think that you don't think the testing breakdown is incompetency by the United States government. I'm not saying it's Trump. It's incompetency by the entire government. Did you hear Fauci talk about it? I I trust I the CDC. Five different. He Five said, different times. I just talked to people all over the world. You can go get tested in Iceland. You can get tested in South Korea. But you right. can't get tested in New York City. Are you right. fucking kidding me? Because we've decided we're doing diagnostic testing only. That's what we're doing. And we have moved that, uh, that off a little bit towards more screening, which is a different system and a different set of goals. But our initial goal was to do diagnostic testing so we pick up people with severe illness. That's what they decided to do. That was not good for more widespread screening. Well, it also wasn't good for knowing who to who should. Who that should wasn't their goal. Their that that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to make sure they had diagnostic testing. I know their goal was to ruin the economy. It seems like and bankrupt thousands of businesses because of incompetency. That's what I think. I don't know. I'm going through it myself. I don't know if my employees are going to have a job in I know. It's days. awful. It's awful. Yeah. I just think it was not very well planned out nor executed, and it just seemed incompetent. How would the testing have changed things? Because you could test people and know that they should stay home. Anybody with symptoms were instructed to stay home. They didn't. That's a different problem. That's a different problem. Right. Well, they did in South Korea. So the, there's something in this American phenomenon. I mean, you know, people aren't taking it seriously because they feel like government lies to them all the time. Maybe. It seems to me like everyone's taking it pretty seriously. I, not, not, I was just out at Home Depot. There were thousands of people walking through around and shopping centers and Home Depot were they, and Walmart. Were, were they practicing? Um, no, you didn't see as many masks as I thought I, I would. But were they practicing distancing? Were they away yeah, from each other? Distancing, right. distancing for okay. sure. Okay. Okay. Well, and, I mean. And what's weird is they're all waiting to get toilet paper and they don't know. I, I, I just think they should tell people, they should have big signs in front of the stores, we're out of toilet paper. Because that's what it, that, that shows you where Americans' heads are at. They're hoarding toilet paper. So weird. I, I still don't quite understand that phenomenon. I, I don't understand it. I went to four places because, you know, we got like four rolls left for a family of four. I've been to seven places in the last two days, all out of toilet paper. Mm. It's crazy. So there's that hoarding mentality, and then there's the party mentality. But I guess there was partiers in Italy, too. Right, the but that, that stops. That's a, that's a late phase phenomenon that stops, right? Well, it was as, uh, as late as two days ago. There was on the beaches of Miami. There was people out there having spring break. That that was a while ago. It was two days, and it was clamped down. That ended. And right. by the way, thank have God that was. Have you seen the thing about the temperatures? That the, the hospitals have temperatures that have GPS, and they send back this thing to a big brain trust. And that Florida has the highest amount of people with temperatures right now. Oh, that's I just interesting. I saw a report about that. That's interesting. And the question is, does that reflect an outbreak? Because their numbers. Yeah, they're trying to figure out whether that leads. Now you're going to see an outbreak like a hot spot of Florida. Right. The the Florida has been way down in numbers, and that'll be interesting. I know. Mm. And that's what led everybody to believe warmer climates. It's all going to be okay. Mm. You know, we'll see. I just, you know, I just. Here's the other thing about about this self-quarantine or, you know, shelter in place or whatever. I shelter I mean, in place, I, I hate that term because it's for an active shooter. It means barricade yourself in a room. I hate that term. Yeah, well, that's what San Francisco is. I know, but they're not supposed LA to barricade themselves in a room. They're supposed to stay home, stay home. Well, no, I think what it really means is how active law enforcement is. Because in mm -hmm. San Francisco, if you're driving, they pull you over. In L.A., they don't. Right. You know, one of the things where... You know, I, I just keep saying, what are the next steps? So so San Francisco's showing us the example of, or, and I guess New York City now, of what L.A.'s next step is. And then I believe if you don't do something to relieve people's anxieties and fears and economic stress and duress, right. you will have civil unrest, then you'll have martial law. 
I just think that's why I keep pointing to, you know, I'm not referring to Trump. And I know that everybody just piles on him. I'm talking about the entire federal government is not, I don't think, seeing what, how, how people are losing their jobs in two weeks or have no money, giving them $1,200 through the computer system a month from now is not going to help. There's still going to be a two-week lapse where they don't have any money. Yeah, I just, I just think that this economic stress that put on the United States was, you know, really not very well thought out. So you don't think it's worth it? No, I think that it could have been done much more excellently. What about rolling like, it? What I, about? I like excellent. Well, what about? All right. What about getting it under control and then rolling back the uh, restrictions? Well, no. The easiest thing to calm American fears is to close the stock market uh, you know, for 30 who days, it? moratorium Some... on the stock market, because people watch the stock market and panic. And then that leads to businesses shutting down or being nervous or laying people off. I mean, it was happening. I was seeing it. I was caught in the middle of it. Yep. It's a free fall, and I've only got you know this X amount of money in the bank, and that's two payrolls worth. What's going to happen? Shut it down. That's why, partially why Shelley's place shut down. I can tell you it's not just because of policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. It's because everyone was so panicked economically. What's going to happen is it's going to go day after day after day, 2,000 points, 3,000 points. They should have shut down the stock market. But that's not going to happen, right? Yeah, that's not right. People should be able to get their money if they need it. No, shutting down the but stock market. the fact market, that they all so showed up at trade. work, that's another thing. No, it's they're not trading. Thing. They're just pulling money out. No, there were people on the floor at the stock market. Who were not uh, practicing social distancing. Exactly. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, New York is going to have a tough weekend. New York is going to have a very difficult weekend. But uh, don't. I think L.A. is about two weeks away from a tinderbox that we haven't seen uh, since 1992. That's my <sighs> Take. I don't think so, Bob. I don't think so. Okay, You're not Bob, helping people's bring anxieties. Bruce on now. Yeah, I know. Bring Bruce in to talk. He's out there working in the ERs. We'll get a report. Yeah, get, get him on there. But I mean, I talk to junkies a hundred times a day. Yeah. And they're panicked. Yeah. And they're ready for action. And that action might be the 99 cent store that's been closed and down the street and you have no food and you don't care and you feel scared and hopeless and helpless and lost trust me so from your point of view you need we need to pull out of this in a couple of weeks to be to be safe we need to reassure people that it's going to be okay that's what i'm doing every day on this periscope you're not on this uh stream you're not helping me bob you're, you're making it sound like it's not going to there are millions of people tuning into trump attacking the abc news reporter what good was that Wait. What purpose did that serve? I know. So get back to calming people down. I think that was a better, better impulse. Yeah. Well. And 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 saying it's going to be okay and we're going to get through this. Right. I, mean, I, I know a lot of people don't think we're going to. They think this is the Great Depression. This is the end. And when people feel like that, especially entitled people that have never suffered any real hardship in their lives, not like our parents. Right. They're going to get desperate. Well, you're worried about that happening, but you're also saying at the same time we're going to get through this. So, how do you have? I personally, I don't. I, I'm, I'm fine. I, you know, I can live any way. That's what I. No, no but Bob, how how do you reconcile having those negative thoughts about everybody uh, gloom and dooming, and instinctively feeling we're going to pull through this? Because I'm talking about myself personally, and then I'm talking about my, uh, our, us as a society, which I'm not crazy about our society for the last. 10, 15 years. I agree with that. And I think that I think that this generation is not ready for it. When you t start talking about sacrifice, my dad was born in 1918. He pounded into me and my sister's heads about sacrifice. No, I know. I think it's interesting. I, I think you're going to see boomers, baby boomers, step up in the face of this whole thing because we, we were raised by that generation who did tell us that. And I, I don't yeah, know about you, but I'm ready to step in in whatever way necessary, <laughs> because this is our time. We weren't called upon when we were 18. Maybe this is when we're being called upon. Well, here's an interesting thing. Initially, two weeks ago, just let me show you this. Initially, two weeks ago, you know, I said I was nervous about outpatient, how you keep people, you know, they're out in the community and whatever. And so 
so I had this idea. We're going to contract two houses, and we're because of the federal relief, we're going to talk to the landlords about about not um, foregoing rent. We're just not going to be able to pay rent. Right. We'll sort it out after this is all over. Right. 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 Then one of them is a friend of mine. I said, "Hey, you know what? This could this could work. You could get federal relief. We could get twenty addicts off the streets into the house as a just a service to the community, and and help them. And they can you know do ambulatory detox on their own. Kind of like give them like a, the the skeletons of a possibility of changing their life. And we went down that road for about twenty four hours until we all realized if something goes wrong." We'll be sued. Yep. We'll lose our livelihood. Yep. You can't do that. You can't help people. Right. So and that's one of my main kind of frustrations with our society. And I see it in this. You have all these helping departments, CDC and Health and Human Services and, and federal federal government and the and the armed services. And they, they're not even allowed to, to collaborate. Right. And that's because of our liability laws, right? Yeah, yeah. Liability so laws. maybe That's why I didn't do this. Maybe right some now, of the stuff I would, I would have I would have food and shelter and and freezer box zone and and stabilize 20 patients right now if I if I was guaranteed that by doing that goodwill and that good deed I would not be sued and have my home taken away from me. Right. I understand. Uh, and and that's something that uh, medicine is faced with every day and maybe part of this crisis will be to sweep away some of that stuff. Maybe that's what I, that's what I'm hoping, at least between the different divisions where you can share information. Right. Yep. So, but I, I'm, I am nervous about Los Angeles. I don't think, I don't think, uh, two, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks without any resources is going to be good for our lesser fortunate brothers and sisters here in this town. I, I would agree with you, but let's assume we're going to flatten the curve. We're doing all this aggressive action in California. And if we flatten the curve and come up with some effective treatments, it's a different outlook. It's a different outlook. So let's see where we are at the end of next week. What number at the end of next week would make you happy? If it only doubled the infection rate. So like uh, 60,000, 40, 40, 50, let's yeah, say 60,000, just to give it a little buffer. How about that? Yeah. So 60,000 by Friday. Rate, if the death rate flattens, that's an interesting thing. You know yep. that that was interesting, that right. it went up, however much it went up, and the death rate barely went up. Yep. Yep. So so that's the point. So if we, if we don't have a, if we get a lot, have a lot more cases, but not a lot of more deaths and I think that would be the ultimate and would, we flatten would, the curve and we have some good treatments coming online. It's going to be a different situation. So at the end of the week, we'll kind of know where we are. You know what I mean? It's still absolute fog of war at this point, but I, I feel like the end of the week and then to induce panic in people is not the right message. And to look at the doomsday curves that every, you know, the epidemiologists are putting out there, that is a disservice to people. So let's just, yeah, let's, that's two, two million, two million people. You know, I've been saying all these death rates, I don't know, 500,000, 700,000, whatever. Most of those people in the category that I've looked at and all the stuff I've read, they were going to die of something else anyway in the next 18 months. Th that's of the pro of the people that are, they're prognosticating about. The, I, the ironic thing to me is, 90,000 addicts die every year in America. In, right. in, in 2019, the numbers right. just came out. It's almost 82,000 addicts died. You right. ever hear anything about them? Right. They're in the Th this is, their lives yes, mostly. this, Bob, that's my point. We, we need to contextualize it with other things that are, you know, flu kills 18,000, addiction kills 85,000. Heart disease kills like half a million. Right. So we have to like contextualize things as we think about the risk rewards of what we're doing. It's always a risk reward ratio. Everything we do has potential adverse consequence. And so presently, we are all well, agreed. What is more tragic is what I'm trying to say. It's more tragic for a 24 year old healthy male yep. to die of a drug overdose than it is a 91 year old demented woman in a Washington nursing home. But to be fair, uh, and the H1N1 killed 20, 40 to 60 year olds. That's pretty much who got killed by that virus. And that was the last pandemic. And we kind of got through that one. So it, again, I'm just trying to get people not to be so anxious about this. We have decided collectively we're going to take a huge, we're going to stomp this thing down very aggressively. Good. We'll get through it quicker that way. And uh, let's all stay on board and not fragment. And let's uh, 
do we got to do to get this thing over with fast? But don't you think there's two anxieties? There's the anxiety of how am I going to feed my family next week? Yes. How am I going to find toilet paper? Yes. yes. That was just poor planning. Yeah. And then am I going to get this thing? Am I susceptible to dying? I think most people, you know, think if they're under 50 years old, they're not going to die. I don't think they're as scared of the virus as they are of this economic doom. And, and let's also remember that three people continue to die every day of homelessness, every day. And in Los Angeles County alone, and if that if the virus were killing three people a day in Los Angeles, oh my God, people would be beside themselves. Right. It's not happening. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, I'll, you know, I've lived a good life even if I do die of it. All right, That's my another thing that I think <laughs> I think people I think people really don't think about more, their own mortality. Well, this forces us to, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, I had a doctor on real. I had a doctor on yesterday or the day before and she wanted to talk about end of life conversations that we should be having and people just crushed her for even talking about it. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough time to have these conversations. Well, I don't have Twitter, so I'll say you know, if I die from this, I lived a beautiful life. Uh, you know, I'll miss my children. I'm sure they'll miss me, but I'm sure that they're strong and they'll survive. And, and that's life. This is life. And People Bob, keep thinking how many purses they own is life. I, Bob, I, I, I thank you for that sentiment. And I, I hope you'll be around on the other side. And I expect <laughs> to see you there, my friend. Okay. But not on the other side of the, 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 the life death divide. I mean, the other side of this epidemic. So I'll see you. Yeah. I'll be in your presence when we get through this. Okay. Okay. See you. All right, later. man. Talk to you soon. Bye -bye. All right. The great Bob Forrest. Uh, you guys know him from Celebrity Rehab and uh, also the um, This Life, This This Life You Live podcast that Bob and I did for a very long time. And now we're going to get to Dr. Spaz. Is he, is he the one calling in, Susan? There he is. All right. Uh, Bruce. Hold on. Let's there get him are. in here. Dr. Bruce. Yes. Hey, Dr. Bruce. Drew. Bruce Heishover. Those of you, the Corolla fans, know him as Doctor Spaz. So, what's how dare uh, you? what's going? How dare you? What's going on out there? Do you have your, well? Do you I, have your computer on or something? We're sitting here hearing some feedback. I have my earphones in the way you told me to. You can't hear me. Yeah. We, your computer did a little feedbacky thing, but go ahead. Tell us more. Okay. What's going on out there? Oh, one more no, thing. No, one no, thing I forgot to say yesterday. Artie Lang, congratulations at a year of sobriety. Somebody just uh, put that on restream, and I meant to say that yesterday, Artie. One year, man. That's a big deal. Well done. Uh, so go ahead. Um, that is. Bruce. Yeah. He's, he's still alive, too. That's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He and Bob. Yeah. So, so, Drew, what do you think? So for my patients, you know, a shout out to my recovering patients and not being able to go to meetings. What do you think of in the rooms dot com? Uh, I there's a number of different uh, sites out there for virtual meetings. I, I still God. For a while, I was I was advising them to go to small meetings. You know, just don't touch, keep social distancing. But in California oh, now, you, you, yeah, you can't do that in California now. That was before the the statewide ban. Um, uh, yeah, you got to do virtual well, anyway, meetings. In the rooms is good. Do that. Fine. In the rooms is good. Yeah. But some a lot of recovering people don't know about it, so they're some of my patients. They're sort of panicking. It's like, oh my god, I don't have, I don't have my meetings to go to and can't get together with my sponsor at the restaurant I usually go to for coffee and stuff like that. Oh, so. it's a big deal. It is a big deal. I, yeah. I've saw I've, my recovering patients from the beginning have said, what, what are we going to do? And, and what happened was a weird split developed in the community. People were trying to get together the small meetings with social distancing. And then the virtue signaler started accusing them of killing people. So, oh. which of course did oh. not happen, uh, but, and, but maybe saved some lives. The fact that they got kept it going as long as they did. So, well, you know, through this crisis now, I'm I'm refraining from talking about German measles, Spanish flu. I've learned about my racist tendencies. I, I'm inherently racist, I guess. So I'm, I'm not calling anything by its by its uh, no name. So you have to use the rubella, roseola. Yeah. Okay. Good. Perfect. It's been an educational process. So just talking to some of the some of my ER buddies out here, they're all saying it's the calm before the storm. There, there's like. Um, not many they're, they're well prepared the tents are outside the patients come in if they have ili you know in, influenza like symptoms uh they're screened carefully and they're not allowed actually into the er unless they're significant you know like low oxygen you know severe shortness of breath right. something that would be evidence and um 
you know, I was talking to my significant other. She's sitting in a room right now with a gentleman that's got an O2 saturation of 93%, fever, and How old? no, uh, How old? 50 years old, <laughs> hypertension, mm. no, but no, no COVID testing. <laughs> Why not? So, uh, well, I guess they're going, they're saying, they're looking at him, and if, he, if his chest x-ray is clear and he's not decompensating, he looks comfortable, let's just send them home. I guess that's what they're going to do. Oh boy, I, well, I, I am I am very against that. That's I, I'm not. I wasn't involved in. There was a 38 year old that died here locally. I wasn't involved in that case, but when I looked at it and they sent him home hypoxic. I thought that we can't do that. That you can't twice, do I that. So, so that guy's a friend of somebody that works over at Kaiser Fontana or a relative or something. But I heard all about that. It's tragic. So, Oof. but so that's from out in the Inland Empire, and it it doesn't seem to be representative. I have uh, a patient whose daughter's an ICU nurse up in Oregon, and she said that they're just swamped. They've got patients out in the halls on ventilators. That's what you know. That's what she said. So where, where is that? Where like is that? Oregon, Oregon, Portland. Yeah, see that's, the, what, that's what. Uh, let me see the she, data up there. Is it yeah, all? Take a look, but it's yeah. The she works at a burn unit and an and ICU, and I don't won't say which hospital, but. So some places, and I'm sure in New York City right now, there's it, now is it going to happen in in L.A.? I haven't, I don't know. You know more about the hospitals in Los Angeles, but out in the inland area here, it's you know uh, in Fontana, the hospital I'm at, seven positive as far as I know, and um, you know the county hospitals, it's it's just not been the inundation that there there doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but. But I, th I think the other thing is that New Yorker article that, that we looked at. Yeah. I think that's also somewhat reassuring if it's, if it's Ex correct. Explain I mean, that to people. People wanted that one, wanted the line and verse on that one. Go ahead. And it is. If you look at Singapore, if you look at countries where they use meticulous hand washing and droplet precautions, in other words, just using a surgical mask, not mandatory N95, um, but using droplet precautions where you're not as concerned about aerosol, uh, which would be when you're doing an intubation or bronchoscopy right. or uh, something where you'd aerosolize. So very few healthcare workers to none, depending if it's Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, using meticulous hand washing, basic gown, and just a surgical mask, which is not you know, screening for the very small aerosolized particles, which we don't think this virus causes. So the idea is that's a real positive because there's been a real concern that this is super contagious. Right. And uh, so say it again, because people take push back on that one real hard. So say it again. Not as if you have meticulous hand washing and if you're in the health a healthcare provider using just a basic surgical mask, which is not the N95 mask uh, that you are in, in some, in some cases uh, zero con contracting this virus so um so it's not that, it's not so much surfaces and it's not you know, at least you can mitigate the surface issue by washing hands and it's not so much aerosols that are out in the in the environment it's uh, direct contact direct contact right. with necessary so at this moment right. there are 137 cases in oregon so that does not sound terrible no it doesn't and uh four deaths total so i would again check your sources i don't i don't know this is yeah the, and this is from the world meters info they put the united states at twenty four thousand seven hundred seventy six, two hundred ninety deaths yeah so you know you hear these stories and you don't know what to believe i i know it's going to be bad in new york this weekend have you been uh watching that new york's yeah i mean that's that is now the i guess the world hot spot in terms of the acceleration in cases right I think I think they did not really take into account the concentrated living environments, uh, particularly up uptown, um, and that people there I don't think necessarily followed recommendations unless they were rigorous. And so that's what I'm hearing is that's where all the cases seem to be coming down from. So, right. Well, and the, the dependence on transportation, like subways and trains, is I mean that's how people get around in New York, and they're. The community spread. When did the community spread start there? It started there some time ago. Right. 
The other thing yeah. was, was it in that same article you were just referred to that we also had evidence that asymptomatic carriers, I think it was another study I read, asymptomatic carriers are not that big a deal. Uh, that asymptomatic carriers, it turns out, even in South Korea, where they documented the most so-called asymptomatic carriers, they were either A, false positive, yes. or B, pre-symptomatic, that 48 hours later, they got sick. Right. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, because well, people, people are coming, getting on my, and I was on a podcast this morning, and they said, there are probably 10 times the number of people documented out there asymptomatic. I thought, that doesn't sound realistic to me. That sounds unrealistic. Right. Well, there's a big demand, and also explaining, and you're probably better at explaining the public health epidemiologic indications for, for testing. I mean, you don't go, it's like you don't get CAT scans on every right member of society to look for tumors or cancer, which a lot of people say, well, what we have CAT scans. And if you're testing, it, it doesn't pay to test every single person. Right. So, uh, so even, even with the current stringent tan standards, which is ICU, fever and pneumonia, travel and contact, all these criteria, even amongst those, the positivity rate amongst all those that are tested is 10%. Right. So if we started screening more widely, we're going to be wasting a lot of tests that we need for diagnostic purposes. Right. And well, so, what infuriates me is I won't mention which news outlets I've been watching, but there, you know, you just this administration can't do anything right. I mean, and and I I look at I like I love Fauci, and I I think it's very frustrating uh, some of the. Uh, fear mongering that's very subtly transmitted through certain media outlets. Uh, right. You know, uh, right. no, I agree. Certainly, with that. I, I keep saying the same thing. I've said it for a month. You. Listen to Anthony Fauci. Do what he tells you. It will be fine. We, you and I went through right. the AIDS epidemic with him. Remember? Yes. I mean, yeah. he was he was our guiding light then too. Yeah, but and he's he's so even keeled. But what I notice is that it seems like they they are dissecting. Uh, chopping up things he says, they're taking them out of context or, you know, sound bites that would imply that it's been grossly mishandled. I, I just wish everyone would look ahead and stop looking back and, you know, accusing of people of doing the wrong thing. It's, there's, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I think the testing, we're going to get more testing hospital based. I think as of Monday, it's really going to amp up and uh, we're going to get what yeah, we need. Yeah, and, and let me be clear. I would like to see more testing. I, I, even though right. I'm not in the position of making that decision, I, I would like to see more testing because i like to know where we are. I want to know where we are. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, absolutely. But I think, on the other hand, just reassure it, – it's so tough. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to be in your position because you are you become sort of a spokesperson for this, but to try and ease people's minds somewhat about the reality of this virus and, and the risk – and you're going to be accused on one side or the other. You're 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 not being realistic enough about how dangerous it is, or or you're creating a lot of concern where you shouldn't. But I mean, if in this in this environment right now, I think uh, what's being done is going to be very effective in terms of you know, like they're talking about flattening the curve. I think that's what we're seeing, and I think it's so. You think? Seeing, the, do you think the curve is flattening? I think so. I mean, right. You know, and so what numbers would make you feel good by the end of next week? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. What, well, what, what, I'm, what I'm curious. I'm just curious what you, curious what, you what your Ooh. sensibility is. Whoop, are you there? Did we lose him? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to get that in. Let me try to get. Um, if antibodies but not infected, uh, are you clear? That's an interesting question. We don't know that yet. So in other words, if you're there are antibody tests for the coronavirus, we don't know the accuracy of those tests yet and what they mean. So the question is, if somebody thinks they had this back in December, which many people probably did, can you test for antibody response to the virus? And if you find it, is it specific enough to tell you you are uh, immune? I don't think we can do that yet. But we might be able to in a couple of months. We might be able to. Uh, let's see. Let's see what you guys want to talk about. Hold on here. I'm You're just on YouTube. I think I blocked Crazy Steve. Okay. Oh, you, you blocked somebody? Well, they were asking you to, but I did it on Restream. Oh, here's Chris. Okay. okay. I don't block people. I let them go crazy. I let them hang, you know, say what they want to say. I, yeah, but sometimes it's inappropriate and people oh. don't want to see it, so they tell me. Okay. That's that you. Better? That's you and the and the listeners. That's me. Uh, yeah, Bruce. 
Um, so you were saying, I, I just was curious on your your instinct. Like, what what is the the kind of numbers by the end of the week, say Friday, that you you'd be feeling pretty good with? Which so what do you mean numbers? Exactly. I'm just well, today that- we're at 24,000, give or take. Uh, what number on Friday, if you saw that number, you'd be like, wow, we're really, we're really flattening this thing. Uh, well, I, I'm just looking at doubling time. I mean, the doubling time is, it, for instance, in New York, it, 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 how many days did it double? And I don't think we're seeing that in, at least in this area here. And I think that the, um, you know, the social distancing and, uh, the semi quarantine uh, activities have have limited the you know that exponential increase. Mm-hmm. So I don't. So as far as you know, it's so it's so different for New, for New York. I don't know what do you think they're going to have to do in New York to to curtail that. I mean that there is a true, um, you know, the number of they, ventilators. They, they what whatever got out is out. And they're going to have to deal with that with hospital beds and ventilators, right? And so, and if they can control that and contain that group a bit, it's going to take a couple weeks to settle down. Uh, and it will stop doubling. It will stop doubling because they'll have people sort of contained. And everybody else needs to just self-quarantine. And they're, right. they're doing the same measures that we're doing here. It's just it's gotten a little ahead of them, a little ahead of them there. And it's going to stress the system. The hospitals are going to look, you know, out of control for a couple of days. Right. Oh, definitely. I did expect out in this area. Now, again, what what's I haven't looked at the data for Los Angeles. You know, we're fair. There's a, a pretty decent concentration of, of what the last 10, 20 years of what. So I I expected, you know, the the concern of the worried well coming in. That's what my colleagues. Oh, right. Saying, you know, you still have the worried well coming in. Right. And we are really. It's a bad season for influenza. I mean, and influenza is a bad actor uh, in in many cases. Yep. Um, so we're still seeing a lot of influenza A and B, and uh, the patient. Their hand. There is a huge increase in the utilization of the. Well, I was looking on the computer today. Look at the waiting room and the level fours and fives that are the sore throats and the sprained ankles and things like that. They're just not coming. That's, that's a good sign. That's, that's good. Right. Fauci say, I don't know. I'm not sure it was him or Azar, but talking about this may change the way Americans utilize health services. That would you know, be, that, that would be nice to switch over to telemedicine instead of ER is a big, make much more sense. Right. Huge. Right. Oh. Yeah. And the addiction medicine, I'm doing everything is telemedicine now. And it really is an efficient, safe way for stable patients. If you have a new patient, you know, there's certain situations where you, of course, you want to have face to face. But then there are these booths where you actually have instrumentation that is being applied to the patient and you're at a distance. So yep. there's some real innovative stuff going on. Yeah. So. No, that's I agree. I think that's going to be a really significant uh, positive outcome from all this. See, my thing, if, if if the doubling time, you know, if, let's say it doubles twice from last Friday, which make it would make it 60,000, because a lot of what we're seeing here today is just the backlog of tests coming in. So that's not reflective of the doubling time. That that would be a doubling time. I don't, I don't know what to make of that, because that's just a backlog of tests popping in. But I, I feel like if, if, twi- if, if we double but from Friday to Monday... And then a li- maybe double by Friday. I think we're in pretty good shape. It's certainly not accelerating, right? No, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I and if we then come up now, let's talk about treatment. What are you hearing about hydroxychloroquine, Bruce? Did I lose you again. Yeah. Yeah. Hydroxy no. hydroxychloroquine. And a, with azithromycin, which is sort of a curious combination right an antibiotic and a yeah i uh, i have not seen anything after the uh, initial small studies but i don't i don't think uh i, I don't know do you know of any new studies going on any information that's come out i, I know there i know there are lots of studies uh, i know that fauci was a little more circumspect today but actually uh, optimistic and that i know that infectious disease doctors are using it routinely routinely so it's being used, it's being studied, and I saw my lead scientist get a little, what I would call it for him, optimistic. 
So yeah. that's all sounding pretty good to me. Well, the, interesting in in areas of Africa where there's uh, hydro, there's you know Plaquenil um, use where there's still malaria. I, apparently, there is no you know coronavirus. So I don't know if you've seen that, but that's sort that's of an interesting. That's pretty take. interesting. So that suggests that that um, that hydroxychloroquine. That suggests it, it might be a um, it might be a prophylactic agent too, right? Interesting. Yeah. Somebody's asking about torsad from uh, hydroxychloroquine or any chloroquine. I'm sure hydroxychloroquine is associated with electrical disturbances of the heart. That makes sense. And if you had a long QT interval, yes, you're predisposed to torsad. So maybe we we used to use blackwood all the time. We didn't make people get uh, EKGs. We got made them see the ophthalmologist once a year. Do you remember right, that? And you have to watch. I, I think it's a combination. If you have other QT prolonging meds with it, that's that's right. a huge, huge issue. Right. What? Yeah, and just that makes me think of methadone. I just had a patient on 240 milligrams of methadone, and <laughs> that's with crazy. The QT prolongation. That person but, should not be on Plaquenil. Uh, right. Exactly. So they also so should the not be on 240 of methadone. Yeah. No, I agree. It's not. It's you know the methadone clinics have an interesting. Acceleration of dose that I'm, I don't Crazy. I don't quite understand. But so people are asking, why don't we test everybody in the country? There, there. That's there. People are confused about diagnostic screening and universal testing. How do we help people understand that? So that's what, that's what I say. It's just like, I, isn't it the same logic? You don't want to do a CAT scan on every single person right. because you get false positives, false negatives, and the system is overwhelmed with with useless information. And and, and test doctors only use tests where they have a high level of suspicion of the outcome. Right. It, that's what right. that's what co creates the what's called accuracy. Accuracy is based on the probability when you do the test that it's likely to be positive. Otherwise, if you right. do it in in a universal setting, it's likely to be wrong and negative. So Don't you want to know if you had it in December? That's a different test. That's an antibody test. And uh, I don't know that we're going to be doing that. I, there, I, I don't even know how to, you know, how to interpret that, Bruce. Do you? No, no. Yeah. I mean, all these tests are basically PCR, right? Uh, not the. I don't think the antibody one is, but but yes, no, they're. But I mean, what they're doing now, most of these yes, tests are. Yes. Yes. So p polymerase chain reaction. In other words, they're taking pieces of the DNA and they're amplifying it so we can look at it, or the RNA, in the case of the, this virus. But that's yeah. a good explanation. It's not intuitively obvious why you don't test the whole population. And right. that was a good explanation. I, I, I didn't do well in statistics, and I don't <laughs> do well in explaining statistics. But intuitively, you think, hey, get, a, get 330 million tests, just test everybody, and, and you know, you've got, you got the solution, but it doesn't work that way. And, right. It, uh, and so what you do first is you try to pick up the cases, the people that have it. That's called diagnostic testing. Then... You start picking up people who may have it. And we're sort of getting into that phase now. And that's the right. phase that we weren't prepared for because the CDC had decided only to have a diagnostic system in place. They didn't prepare this more broad screening. And that took, as Fauci said, a private public kind of a, a liaison to get, make that happen. And it's remarkable that we're doing that. So it's good. All right. So are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic? Are you feeling good about it? I'm optimistic, but because of my age and my uh, cowardice, I'm not anxious to go to the ER. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of addiction medicine shift. <laughs> Susan, stop. And, and uh, I've got a bone to pick with Susan. What, what phone number do you have for me? You know, your ratings would have been huge if I'd been on this week more. Oh, my God. <laughs> no. I was texting some random number. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Well, we'll check back in with you. And um, I, I, my, what you had told me last time was the ERs are rather quiet because the people, the – People that shouldn't be coming in aren't coming in. No, there are empty beds and the waiting room's not teeming. Of course, you know, there are tents outside, so there's there's a lot of screening going on. It's so far not overwhelmed, at least the Inland Empire, and the, there's a paucity of, uh, of masks. You know, if you want an N95 mask, you have to uh, get it out of – you have to get the head nurse to, to unlock the cupboard. But – um, I think I'm sort of optimistic about it at this point. And I, that New Yorker article, I think the rigid adherence to, you know, staying three feet away and, and uh, hand washing, um, it, it's just I'm, I'm always, you know, becoming aware of touching your face, uh, 
it's some of these things are yep. take some time and uh you know you have to get used to you have to get used to changing the way you're way you're doing things uh plevancy i think is your screen name wants to know where we got the 10 percent positivity rate that was dr burks at the podium at the press pool at the white house and that was two days ago and she was actually gloating that it was as high as that because before that it had been four percent that only four percent of the testing was turning up positive and she was saying how this was going in a good direction that we were selecting cases that should be tested but that's still 90 percent are negative right she, I think she's right. doing a good job too, by the way. Uh, you know, it's so political. If you say you think they're doing a good job, then it's like, you know, there's some criticism and it's, I do, I do think they're doing a good job. And I think the reasons why the testing wasn't, you know, it, uh, right out of the gate. I mean, some of the testing in other countries were flawed and there were high false positive and false negative rates, et cetera. So it's, it's always more complicated. Uh, you know, sometimes the simplest explanation What's Oakham's razor or whatever that? Oakham's razor, yeah, yeah, but not always the simplest explanation. So, uh, Jason made an interesting point here, and I want to ask you about this. Which I've been saying that you know, whenever the U.S. healthcare system gets rated relative to other countries, it's based on all kinds of criteria, none of which measure our ability to respond to something like this. And I'm of the opinion that nobody does this kind of thing better than us. That our peers. Our hospital administrators, our infrastructure, we are innovative and we respond and we get it done. I, I, and I don't think anybody in the world can do it as well as we're doing it. Do you agree with me? Oh, my God, no. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Yeah. I, my experience, I have family in Norway that are medical. And just comparing notes, it's also, you know, expectations. The, the high, high expectations that we have to provide care, even at end of life, to, you know, it, it's, we meet expectations extraordinarily well. And I, I think if you look at the next couple of weeks, just a lot of this is like, uh, you know, you watch Ford versus Ferrari, uh, the, the history, and you watch how Ford was building planes. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm way off, but I think we're going to really meet the need by this partnership between public and private. Yeah, we have Hanes now. Up. We have Hanes jeans now producing masks. So it's, yes, right. we are converting to a wartime economy exactly like that. And and uh, what are your what philosophically does your family in Norway say? Well, my family in Norway says this is they're more fatalistic about much of this. It's 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 a matter of uh, you provide care. It's not rationing it. It's just when you're 90 years old and you're in a nursing home, you don't they don't put people on ventilators. And I know some ER friends over there. Somebody comes in in CHF and congestive you know, heart failure they don't get a TAVR procedure to fix their heart valve and you know but they're they're basically sent home and told you know because if you have chf at 90 and you have a 10 percent ejection fraction you're really you know it's like a, what's your five-year survival rate it's nil and so they're, they're basically more realistic so so with a situation like this um you know they're more and they're very happy with their situation. They don't complain about the government not providing. And uh, for instance, I was, uh, they were telling me, well, we, we pay 50% in taxes here and we're provided with medical care and they're very happy with their medical care. But when we compared notes and, and I talked about end of life care and some of the extraordinary measures we take, they, they didn't, they felt, well, that's unnecessary. That's stupid. That's a waste of resources. So, so anyway, I, I'm looking them up right now on one of the okay. web, one of the websites. Yeah, it's Kate Shanahan. Kate Shanahan got, be careful. That. You'll get some pushback for the, even bringing that it's up true. as a topic of discussion. Uh, I can't find Norway on the list of other countries uh, to figure out what their incident is, incidence is right now. Do you have any idea offhand how they're doing? No. Wow, it's just not. Uh, uh, no. Denmark is 977 <laughs> cases. That's right nearby. Sweden is 1,100. Norway, here we are, 1,400 cases. Uh, three, really? Yeah. Is that a lot or a little? Uh, I thought that's a lot more than I thought, but probably mostly in the on the eastern, you know, Oslo and uh, shared border with Sweden, and where people are coming in from Denmark. But the um, now, what did you say? Shanahan's not going to agree with what? No, she agrees with the. She had a conversation on this stream about end of life conversations, and people just went berserk. 
So she was just wanting to talk about it. It wasn't saying what you should do. She wasn't saying not, don't intervene on people. She was saying, here's how you have these conversations. Right. So, also, we have a show tomorrow with Adam Carolla. Yeah, Carolla's coming in tomorrow, Bruce. Maybe we'll call you when Adam's in here. <laughs> yeah, I got a few bones to pick with Adam. What, as okay. far as what? 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 And Steve-O. But oh, we'll it's Steve-O, too. Calls, so I think, yeah. you, Bruce, you, you should definitely. Well, what, what is the bone to pick? Now I'm curious. Well, you know, um, I love filling in because I think I'm the only one that's gotten thrown out, thrown off the air. I sort of enjoy irritating Adam. It's Maybe a mark of distinction. Cool. <laughs> it's a mark of distinction. I'll grant it's you that. A, I've, got, I've got an ace award for being the most um, irritating guest. So, whatever. That's, you that, just discount. You know, Drew, I have a wonderful I have a, I have a car that would give you a nervous breakdown. I have my 2005, and Adam just doesn't acknowledge it because he's, you know, he's such a snob about sports cars. So. Ah, that's the bone. That's the bone you have to pick with no. him? No. Oh, no, no. no. Yeah, there, there are several bones of contention. Well, but, give me one. You know, being, give me one. If you Okay, so if you Google Dr. Spaz, which my patients have pointed this out to me, you know, create, you Google Dr. Spaz and my name and face come up. Now, <laughs> that's really, uh, you know, enigmatic of my relationship with Adam. It's like uh, at his ex at my expense, you know, it's just one more one more nail in my professional coffin. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! No, I mean, it's all good natured, but as you know, um, you're you're the silver fox. You're the you're the uh, you're the esteemed physician, and I'm Doctor Spaz. I mean, I'm very happy with that. It's it's like, uh, but I'm telling you, you know, because patients Google everything, and so they they see some of this stuff. It's like, are you a real doctor? So, oh boy, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm looking for, Beautiful. I'm looking for are the U.S. Well, I can't get this data right. Uh, as we finish things up here today, we are at twenty four thousand seven hundred cases with three hundred one deaths which is still about, how much is that? 1%-ish? Also, don't Close forget to, to give a shout out to Blue Microphones. Oh yeah, our friends at Blue Mic, thank you, thank you, thank you. The, the, the you've, Everything about our audio quality and what I'm listening to on my headphones, we thank you guys so much. If people are out there thinking about forming a podcast or if you're audio anything uh, or a YouTube page, uh, bluemike.com and for make, and for hydrolite for making a comeback hydrolite's back which is another point which is people are not thinking about rehydration which is really important right now uh, hydrolite is your best 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 source for that uh, let's see I'm really quick um, before we wrap things up wisdom on the numbers seeing in New York yeah New York is going to be rough this weekend um, New York is going to have a, a, a surge and uh, and Bruce you said your friends in the Inland Empire are worried about the surge you know, I, I've talked to people in New York and the surge, when it comes, it, it, it comes. It doesn't like, yeah. you don't have to wait for it. it. It shows up and they're in the midst of it right now. And uh, hopefully it will, that will plateau. In other words, rather than continuing to surge, there'll be some plateauing there because of the aggressive measures they took a few days ago to lock New York down. They were late. They were late in doing it, it looks like, but they have done it. And hopefully that will keep this thing from getting really out of control. Yeah, I really enjoyed listening to quote to Governor Cuomo. I thought he was just very uh, reassuring, and down home type. Agreed. Uh, and listen, and his uh, I guess Chris Cuomo's his brother at CNN. He, mm -hmm. I, I want to tip my hat to him too because so many journalists need to shut up. They are just fanning the flames of panic. And Chris has taken. He said, "You know what? I am not helping things by all the negativity. We're going to look at. We're going to look positively going forward, and 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 ju not just doomsday, which, by the way, are based on us doing nothing. And look at what's probably going to happen based on all the aggressive measures we're taking." Hats off to Mr. Cuomo at CNN. Yeah, well, I, you know, listen, I'm I'm not Democrat or Republican, but uh, the Democrats could do a lot worse than Cuomo running for president. <laughs> it could happen. Rather, somebody with cognitive decline. It, it could happen. It could happen. All yeah. right. Uh, All why right. is New York surging? Be because they are concentrated in a very concentrated environment, and they didn't really clamp it down quite the way they should have in that kind of an environment. Uh, and so, and again, I'm I'm thinking it it's tearing through the projects up in northern uh, New York, based on what I'm hearing, and that they should have thought about that environment and how how prone that environment would be to people catching it. And, and I I don't think people went through that process. So. All right. Well, well I think a, a week ago the subways were still packed, and and that what better breeding ground for 
for this virus. I mean, yeah, but the, but to be fair to them, the subways were, were. I was there a week and a half ago, and they uh -huh. were they were not packed. They were, and everybody was practiced socially. Yeah, but we didn't. We didn't. Go on the subway at five o'clock. Remember, we took. Yes, we tried to avoid it, but but when I went on, there was social distancing, and there they were cleaning it with Clorox three times a day, which is something I wish they would do all year round. That's what I kept saying. Cab or you have to take the subway. Well, the cabs freak me out a little more, frankly, because yeah. the yeah. the cabs you're sitting in there and touching everything, uh -huh. and you can't control your environment. I felt more in control of my environment in the subway. I mean, I really absolutely. did. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I was I had mixed feelings about the cabs, but uh, be that as and I knew they weren't cleaning them out with Clorox every time yeah. somebody went by, <laughs> so so again th th let's not blame public transportation so much as I'm going to tell you because it was the it's the environment of living in certain parts of New York it's just not it's not ventilated it's people on top of each other think about an elevator Bruce you walk in an elevator just after somebody coughs in it you don't think you're going to get the coronavirus then. Right? No, you're absolutely right. In an, un I grew in an unventilated up in New York, living in that environment, and you just I just think back to you know all my experiences on public transportation and uh, the, the density of, of people in in Manhattan. It's just uh, it's it's not surprising what's happening there, but right. we'll see. Right, and and the fact they didn't really think about the environments and take special precautions. They did in the subway. But they didn't in the living environments. And I, I'm telling you, if you can take stairs, take the stairs. Uh, whatever whatever region you're in, I would avoid elevators because I feel like that's when we talk about the aerosolized uh, virus, you know, somebody coughs and you walk in a minute later. We're on the 27th floor. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that you got to figure out ways to, to do this. You got to figure out ways to limit your, maybe you wear a mask always when you go in an elevator. Said that just go with the, your party or your family up the elevator. They don't allow more than four people in an elevator at the same time. You just have to hold your breath. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, what about, I just, the last thing is this, this restaurant, uh, lax, laxity of buying liquor and being able to take out liquor. I mean, that, that's very interesting. The, uh, well, let's let, but let's let's think about why they did that. They did that because that's the how restaurants make their money is sell, yeah. selling cocktails, right? And so they're trying oh, yeah. they're trying to let them. And we have friends that say you can drive by and get a cocktail. <laughs> Ext di diff, you know, extraordinary times. <laughs> I'm coming by. Oh yeah, not any. So my friends own Corky's out here, and then my other friend has a couple taverns, and uh, it's it's tough. It, these are small businesses that are extraordinarily concerned about the welfare of their employees. And, yeah. uh, you know, but it's just working in the addiction field. You know, I, I mean, some of the patients are ready. They're like cracking up. They're going, Oh boy, that's great. We can uh, have takeout cocktails. So it, let's, let's hope it doesn't cause another problem. <laughs> I'm gonna, like drunk driving and, uh, I don't and think you're allowed to drink it. You're, you're not, but it's an know. open container, theoretically, of some type. And no, they probably... I, I just, I'm worried. I'm just worried. <laughs> so, and I don't want yeah. more alcoholism. Means, if I can right? avoid it. You can drive by and get a bottle. All right, guys. Bruce, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate it very, very yeah. much. And uh, we'll maybe I'll see if I can get Corolla to, you know, agree to let you stop by. If not, we'll check in next week, okay? Okay, sounds good. All right, man. All take right, care. guys. Good talking to you. Bye-bye. Right. I love you, Bruce. So thank you, everybody, for uh, hanging in here on the restream. I'm looking at all your comments. Um, yeah, Paulina wants you to uh, mention her. Oh, yeah. So Ooh. my daughter is working in New York City where they are restrict having restriction. I'm going to get the actual uh, website and stuff for you here. Um, this is an organization that does a lot of housing of homeless and uh, sheltering of domestic violence uh, survivors. And they need supplies right now. It's called the Urban Resource Institute. It's the largest provider of emergency shelter for domestic violence, homeless families, adults with disabilities, developmental disabilities particularly. They need some emergency funds. And with your donation, you will help URI purchase necessary items through April. So if you want to make a difference, go to urinyc.org. URI I'm sorry, urinyc.org. And uh, if you want to just, uh, you can find their GoFundMe page there or visit uh, the same thing at my website. If you go to drdrew.com slash U-R-I-N-Y-C. It's, it's drdrew.com slash U-R-I-N-Y-C. And, uh, you know, I think this is the time when we step up, everybody. This is when you step up. That's the kind of thing you can step up for pretty easily. Just a nominal donation can help 
help a lot. So th this is you're this is tweet it out on your tweet sure. your Twitter too. This so is when uh, we get to make a difference. Uh, we can talk all we want about social justice, but uh, it's in situations like this when you gotta step it up. Uh, and uh, let's do it. Come on. So we'll post it on your Twitter too if anybody wants to go there after the show. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be in here tomorrow at three o'clock with Adam Carolla. And uh, I don't know how much of it's gonna be. Well, he's, he called me today. He wanted to talk about Corona. So I, I'm going to bet he's got Corona on the mind. Now, I will warn you before we get in here with him, he is a um, fatalist. <laughs> uh, and he's not showering. He's not using soap. And he is uh, not not really sheltering in place, as and they then say. Steve and then Steve-O has a question for him. He's going to call in and we'll get a little, little uh, input from Steve-O. Steve-O called and say he was going to rent a big, a big uh, auditorium because everything was canceled. And do what? And do some tricks or something with, I don't well, know. We'll see he what, told me this. All so right. Well, I believe you. We'll see what he has to say tomorrow. He'll be in here also. Or not in here, but Corolla will be in here. Yeah, and we'll try we to practice a little bit of social distancing yeah, as best we can. Per, but you've already been around Adam this week. So it's true, I have. Okay. But if he's, I, I have a little bit of nervousness with him out there being so cavalier. So mm. be that as it may. Well, I mean, you guys work together, so I guess... <laughs> You're going to catch it anyways. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for the restream. Thank you for watching us. And we'll see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock for more of this.